Welcome to this webinar organized by Azapo Limpopo. On the 25th of April, 1974, the military dictatorship in Portugal expired through peaceful protests in Lisbon and other cities. Six months later was the scheduled nominal takeover of Frilimo in Mozambique, of MPLA in Angola, and the other Portuguese colonies in the, on the continent. The Black Consciousness organizations led by BPC and Sasso decided to celebrate the advent of freedom with our immediate neighbor, Mozambique. While Angola was also a neighbor because Namibia, then Southwest Africa, was run by Pretoria. The fact is that we shared a common language and we shared an immediate history of liberation with Frilimo in Mozambique. And the decision taken by the leadership of Sasso and BPC was that we should call this the, the Viva Frelimo Rally that would be held in all the centers where we had a significant presence. The rallies were announced on Sunday, the 22nd of uh, September, in the weekend press, and sense of electric anticipation gripped the country. On the one hand, the black majority felt exhilarated, and on the other, the white minority felt exceedingly threatened. The very next day, militia threatened to stop the rallies if the government didn't step in. So that evening, the Monday evening, the government announced, the apartheid government announced that, the ban, that, that all the rallies were banned. Muntu Mieza issued a joint statement on behalf of Sasso and BPC, saying, we are not aware of any banning. Even if there were, the will of the people shall not be suppressed by a foreign settler minority regime. And so the path was set for uncertainty, excitement, exhilaration, and confrontation. As it turned out, on the very morning of the 25th of September, the Government Gazette was printed, which banned all the rallies. That evening, that afternoon in Turfloop, that evening in Curry's Fountain, in various other places where people attempted to gather because we did not have social media, we did not have television or radio that we could uh, announce the banning through. It was only the print media. And the broadcaster was a state broadcaster. It broadcast only what the government wanted. So, from that afternoon and continuing for a few weeks thereafter, various Sasso BPC leaders, as well as other activists, were arrested. All of them, all of us, were transported to Pretoria. And because Pretoria local prison could not uh, take all of us, some were detained in various police stations uh, near Pretoria, as far away as Brits and Fluck Flats. Amongst the accused were, besides Muntu Mieza and myself, Patrick Lekota, Aubrey Mokwape, Nkwenkwe Nkomo, Zidulele Tindi, Strini Mudli, and our two panelists today, 
Pandelani Nefolovodwe, whom you know as a past president of Azapo, and Kabaroni KK, popularly known as KK, Sedibe. Our trial uh, started on the 31st of January, 1975. That evening at about 6, 6.30, we were brought to a special session of the Magistrates Court in Pretoria, and 13 of us were arraigned. It's significant that when the, tr the case was called, it was called in Afrikaans, and even though there were only uh, three of us who really didn't study Afrikaans, that was Srini Mudli, Lingam Mudli, and myself, we didn't do Afrikaans in school at all. Immediately, Pandelani Nefalovodwe, the whole lot of the accused started saying, we want a translator because we don't understand Afrikaans. And the proceedings had to be stopped. They had to get a translator to come in. Can you imagine that most of us are detained from the 25th of September, 1974. We brought to the magistrate's court on the 31st of January. And all of us are in our early to mid twenties. One or two were slightly older, but from that point, without members of the public present, with only the system there, the magistrate, the court officials, the prosecutor, and security policemen. We raise, we want an interpreter. So proceedings had to be adjourned for about half an hour while they found an interpreter, because it was after hours anyway. Meanwhile, Ismail Ayub was present. How he got there was a mystery to us, and we interrogated him on how he happened to be in the magistrate's court. And he gave us an, a, a, you know, different reason saying, you know, he was called. Somebody said, well, Shan Chetty is our attorney. He said, well, he's been in touch with him, etc., etc." Eventually, somebody said amongst the accused, it must be the system, the SBs, who called you. And he acknowledged that it was the SBs who called him to be our uh, attorney. So after four months in solitary confinement, after brutal torture, after much aggression by security policemen, we adopt the attitude that we want to control our trial on the very first remand date. And thus it is that the entire trial proceeded on the basis that the accused, 13 initially, Nomsisi Krai, Kuzwai was added as the 14th, and then months later in 75, charges against all the others were withdrawn and the nine Sasso BPC remained as the accused. Throughout that trial, except for finer legal points, we determined the pace of that trial. So it was that we planned that Steve Biko would be our opening defense witness. Steve being Steve, decided to take two weeks to drive from King Williamstown to Pretoria and didn't arrive on the day that the case was supposed to have started uh, in, in, at the beginning of April. So we had an, a second witness, Rick Turner, who was one of the New SAS 8 that was banned at the same time that the SASO BPC 8 were banned on, uh, at the beginning of 1973, February uh, 28th, 1973, there were eight Sasso BPC uh, leaders banned, as well as New SAS leaders. He was one of those. So Rick Turner then became our first witness. It was important for us to also present this notion that certain people within the establishment, especially the media, 
and amongst sections of the liberation movement who understood black consciousness to be anti-white and a chauvinism. It was important for us to dispel that myth that being pro yourself automatically entailed being anti somebody else. So Rick Turner testified and still no Steve. Bishop Manaps Butelezi testified, still no Steve. And then I had entered the witness box on the 12th of April. My stay in the witness box was for three weeks. And of course, on the second day or so of my testimony, Steve trots into court. His testimony has been made legend by the testimony of Steve Biko. But let me say right at the outset, that the testimony of each of the accused in their mid to late 20s by the time we testified make for riveting drama and reading. It's a pity that Azapo, for instance, and the Black Consciousness organizations have not thought it appropriate to publish the testimonies of Zitulele Tindi, Secretary General of Azapo now, Pandalani Nefalovodwe, past president, and so on and so on. Because that would give you an intimate understanding of who these leaders were and are, and the context in which we came to the fore after the PAC engaged in the peaceful anti-pass campaign on the 21st of March, 1960. The following month, Ferfoot bans both the PAC and the ANC. Then we have Mkonto Wesizwe declaring itself on the 16th of December, 1961. We have the Rivonia trial, and then spasmodically trials happening uh, of people infiltrating into the country. But until the advent of Sasso, a pall of fear had engulfed the entire community. And the reason I'm giving this background is that it's important that even within you in Azapo, in the main, you probably don't have a full understanding of that signal history. That people in their early 20s, would decide to challenge the might of the most militarist state on the southern tip of the African continent. The most virulent forms of racism, arguably after Hitler Germany, imposed itself on our people and kept them apart. Effectively, then, this trial was black consciousness on trial. Somebody said to me two days ago, not a stone had been lifted or thrown. And that's true. It was for the ideology of black consciousness, that project of conscientization, and that affinity with Frelimo right next door, saying viva to them on accession to power, that put the system against the wall. And for that, we knew we were going to get convicted. I should say right at the outset that at the end of February 1976, before the defense trial started, the state was still concluding its evidence. Kenny Rachidi, who was president of Azapo, Tiza Mazibuko, who was uh, president of BPC, sorry, Tiza Mazibuko, who was secretary general of the BPC, Drake Corker, who had been the coordinator of the ad hoc committee to form BPC, Tom Mantata, who'd been in that ad hoc committee, Aubrey Mokwena, Seth Mazibuko, and a few others visited the nine of us in Pretoria prison. And after our customary greetings, you know how we spend time with our handshakes and hugs and so on, Kenny and Tom and Drake raised that something big was brewing in Soweto as a result 
of the forcible imposition of Afrikaans. The worry they had was that if this blows up, we would be convicted. Immediately we said, we were in leadership, but now you are. The struggle continues. So I'm raising this because there's all sorts of myth about the nexus between what happened in June 16th and the black consciousness period. But here were leaders, some of them alive, who can verify that that actually did happen. With that background in mind, our, tri our trial ended with our being convicted, as we knew we would be. And on the 21st of December, 1976, all of us were sentenced to either a minimum five years on, e well, a minimum of five years on each count, and that resulted in Untumieza, Tere Lekota, Obri Mokwape, Nguengue Nkomo, Pandalani Nefalovodwe, Kabaroni Sedibe, Zitulele Tindi, Strini Mudli, and myself being sent to Robben Island. The very next day, we were transported via the uh, death row cells and then arrived in Robben Island on the 23rd of December, almost on the eve of Christmas, 1976. There were black consciousness activists already in Robben Island, notably Musibudi Mangena, former president of Azapo, uh, Skarp, uh, Nkutseo Motsao, various others from the Eastern Cape, but the biggest number comprised the Sasso BPC-9, as well as young students from uh, UWC. I'm going to now call on Pandalani Nefalovodwe to give you a glimpse from his perspective of what happened in Robben Island. Over to you, Pandalani. Yeah, thank you, Zed. Um, when we arrived, we were immediately taken to uh, a section which is meant as an observation a section to observe uh, so that uh, when you finish your observation, they can then determine where you should be taken for purposes of uh, serving your sentence. But then we found also uh, comrades from UWC who were also with us in that section. And finally, we were all taken to a section which was specifically meant for uh, what was referred to as the people of the Swart Khefar, uh, which was uh, a section for people who participated in June 16, uh, which is a section there. If you go to Robben Island, it's a, a section E. And we stayed there, and uh, they then, uh, in their own way of wanting us to be subjected to their power, they took us, amongst others, to the quarry uh, to go and work there. But being ourselves, we are told, uh, told ourselves that you know, we are not going to koto. We were going to show them that we are political prisoners and uh, we are not supposed uh, to be subjected to hard labor. So all sorts of things happened there. We would working sometimes very slowly 
and the water who was uh, looking after us, he would want to shout at us, but uh, we were what you may refer to as uncontrollable. And uh, some fights ensured, and a dog was uh, put on us, but and uh, we had uh, some of our guys ended up being charged. But finally, that whole fighting, toing and throwing with them, um, ended up uh, with us fighting them even when we were in ourselves. You see, they had a tendency of coming to visit us from time to time, sometimes being drunk and uh, uh, wanting to us to stand up and shout at us and say, Mark fast your bikey. Um, still, the fight was on. And finally, they realized that uh, they could not control these uh, black consciousness fellows. They decided uh, to build a, a special place for the black consciousness movement. Uh, leadership. And uh, that was built uh, uh, with speed. There is a section on Robben Island which is called Section A. It was built with speed and walls were put all over so that uh, when you are in that section, you cannot be able to even see where the other sections are. You are isolated by being in your cell, but if you are uh, outside your cell, you cannot see any further uh, than the walls that were surrounding you. That was the uh, way in which they interpreted uh, our resolve to continue to fight them even in prison. So a section was built, and we were all taken there. And then Comrade Seth Cooper and Comrade uh, KK, as he's uh, popularly referred to, and uh, Zitulele Kindi were taken to uh, Section B, which was uh, a section where uh, all the political leadership were staying, that is PAC, SWAPO, and the ANC, as well as the unity movement leaders uh, were staying in that section. So Comrade Sets and Comrade uh, KK and Comrade Tulele Kindi were separated from um, uh, the rest of us. We were then taken uh, to section uh, a. But with the uh, times of interaction with the system, as we called it, it became very clear to them that uh, if those who were in section A and those who were in section B were not different. And uh, at one stage or the other, they decided to say, well, the two sections must be allowed to mix. And finally, we were allowed to visit each other, particularly on weekends. Uh, the section that uh, housed uh, the political leadership of the PAC, the ANC, the SAPO, and us who were in the section referred to as Section A, we were allowed to mix. By that time, we had already been joined by some of the comrades that we found on Robben Island who were serving uh, life sentences for one reason or the other. After a long, long time, they were then brought to stay with us in Section A. So as time went on, we were able now um, 
to discuss political issues with the leadership of the ANC, the leadership of the PAC, and Swapo was represented by only one person, which is Toivo Jatoivo. And uh, we found a lot of different of differences of interpretation of the struggle when we were uh, mixing with this leadership. Even the leadership themselves, one by one, um, they didn't believe entirely in the same things that uh, many people believe they did. If I just to give you an example, um, Gavin Becky uh, had his own interpretation completely different from that of Mandela. And uh, he would be able to tell you that you no, know, he doesn't agree with Mandela on many issues. But this is not the platform on which we I'm going to discuss that. We then also stayed in section A with uh, uh, the MK fellows who were one by one coming after 1976. Some of them ended up in section A, uh, the likes of Guala and an old man called Kaba who's uh, popularly known as Mfenendad. So we also interacted with them and we found that Comrade Guala didn't actually like Mandela completely because he had uh, he felt that Mandela was compromising the struggle of our people. And we ourselves, at that stage, we had also reached a conclusion that the way in which particularly Mandela and the other comrades were looking at the future of our country was not what the Black Consciousness Movement would have loved our country to be. And that is today very, very clear that their interpretation of a free and democratic country Yeah, that's fine. It is not the same country that we and Steve Biko envisaged. So it's very clear that uh, uh, quite from the days of our trial, um, we were clear that uh, here we are together in prison, yes. Uh, we are political prisoners together, yes, but we were convinced that uh, the outcome of the struggle, if it was led by uh, the other uh, fellows and ourselves, would not be the same at all, at all. And today I'm convinced, as I talk now, that we were right. So. But prison is prison. When we were in prison, uh, the kinds of things that we were able to see already as some compromises was that in prison, when you enter, you are uh, designated group D. And as you behave according to their own rules, they would promote you from that D to C, from C to B, and from B to A. And these uh, categories, they go with your uh, privileges, how many letters you should receive, and the niceties that you may also get, you could buy, certain things that other prisoners are not allowed to buy. And uh, that question became a conflict 
area between ourselves and the older prisoners we found in prison. Because by that time, some of them had already been classified A, in which case they were receiving privileges uh, as A group. And we had decided as the Black Consciousness Movement in prison that we were not going to allow the establishment to divide us on the basis of who gets what privilege. So we then had a policy that if you belong to us and you're part of the Black Consciousness Movement in prison, you would be Group D right through up until the day your sentence is over. And that we succeeded in doing. And now it meant that when Comrade Sets and Comrade Zit and Comrade KK, who were staying with the older prisoners in that section B, it meant that when they buy their niceties and other things and offer them, there were instances where uh, our comrades would say, no, thank you. We have a policy which says we don't want to be classified and therefore we don't want to be uh, enjoying privileges back door. And that caused a lot of tension between us and the other leadership. Also, our attitude in prison was quite, quite different because we maintained that we will continue to behave the same way as we did when we were waging the struggle. For instance, we will raise our clan's fist very high whenever we meet other prisoners. Didn't matter which prison, prisoner was it. And that was not allowed by the system in prison. Uh, but we defied it and up until um, it was allowed. But still, the behavior of the older prisoners, I think they had been subjected to real, real danger. But some of them would not raise the fist when we raise it. And to our other young comrades, it became a sore point uh, where they had to question the older prisoners as to why are you not doing these things, even when we had succeeded to make the system to agree. Now, that is just really a general view uh, of what transpired between us and the other prisoners and what transpired between us and the system. Uh, we harassed the system in as much as it wanted to harass us up until they had to create a section where they thought they would control us, but uh, we remain what we were. So let me leave it there and KK will take um, uh, talk about other things later. Thank you, Nef. Thank you. Uh, Kabaroni Sedibe was the president of the SRC at the time that the Viva Frelimo rallies were scheduled to happen. And I'm going to hand over to him now to give you his perspective uh, or, and his take on issues, other issues in Robben Island. Over to you, KK. Uh, thank you, uh, Comrade Sets. Uh, it's unfortunate that uh, my camera can be connected. However, I think you and Comrade Neff have um, dealt with the issues that need to be attended to. And uh, some of the points that I need to make are as follows. Um, we had never really wanted to inquire what Robin means but the, the word robin is the dutch word that in english means a seal an animal that we find in the sea 
Now, um, I always say to people, we were um, delivered like parcels. Like when you deliver a parcel from a factory to a shop, we were delivered just like that to Robben Island. The point has been made by um, the facilitator that we were just after our conviction, whilst we were still waiting that maybe over the weekend we would see our families, we were taken unceremoniously through a truck driven over a period of 24 hours from Pretoria to Robben Island. Really to uh, the Cape Town uh, docks. When we arrived there at the dock in order to be taken to Robben Island by the ferry, Comrade uh, Nchaupe didn't want to actually uh, make us uh, to feel uh, very nervous and start maybe fighting. He just on his own said, I want to see the doctor. The doctor checked him and found that his, eye, his pressure, his blood pressure was very high. He wanted to create that evidence because we would need it in future. Now, um, a point I need to say about the, the trial, it has been properly uh, dealt with already, is that um, the defense witnesses, where their evidence was totally rejected by the judge, a chap called Judge Boshoff. He rejected it on the basis that they are people who work with us, then they are bound to defend us. And that's where it ended. Very good people who came to defend us, like, for instance, the late Dr. Manas Butelezi, they came there, but their evidence was just rejected in one sentence. Now, when we arrived uh, on Robben Island, uh, Comrade Neff has already uh, hinted at the point that we went to the observation uh, section. The nine of us were joined by uh, the comrades uh, from the University of the Western Cape, Paul Blykis, Owen Stearman, Bertie Gonzalez, uh, etc. That very observation section is a section where Zafendas was kept. Zafendas who made that uh, Ferwurt in 1966. But uh, of interest as well there is that we met um, a gentleman. He was a he was a, a convicted, but we don't know really what happened to him. A uh, comrade Zwane. He used to talk with Nchaupe all the time and uh, he used to say guys we must just go on that guy we don't know how he landed here he was apparently taken away from Robben Island but it's an issue that needs to be followed as to where he ended up being taken to now after the so-called observation we were taken to E section which came really to be what we call the Clep Hoyers section. At E section, we met all the militant army of freedom fighters from South Africa. You name any place in South Africa, you find uh, an activist that came from those areas. Um, Militancy needs to be shown in action. And um, the place where we con collected our food from the main kitchen, at the gate. When you were at the gate, you could see the main kitchen and um, the other uh, comrades from the other uh, sections, section and G. You would see them queuing there to collect their food. And as we went to the, uh, to the gate of uh, the section to collect uh, the, the food, 
we would raise our fist and say, Amandra. The orders, of course, would try to stop us, we would just carry on. We carried on and until they decided, no, let's give up, let me leave these guys, let them grieve as they wish. And that was a sign of the militancy of the guys. That in spite of the fact that they were trap hoyers outside and they were now in prison, they could never really be controlled by the system. Now, um, the raising of the Black Power Salute really made the prison authorities mad. There are many, um, uh, 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 some of the comrades uh, from the E section would be called to the administration to do something. They would see some of the prisoners on prison and raise the Black Power Salute. Those, uh, 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 some of our comrades on prison actually would run away from raising the, the, the Black Power Salute. Um, the experience that Comrade Neff has uh, talked about at the quarry is important to relate. We were digging at the quarry where most of the prisoners had actually also went. But as we were digging, it became a very deep cave. And uh, one day we said to the warders, no, we cannot continue digging there. It's dangerous. This cave is going to fall and bury us alive. And uh, we refused to work. And then uh, they set the dogs on us. And then uh, we said we are not working. And then were taken back to the prison. And then um, some of us were charged for that uh, incident. Um, comrade uh, Seth Cooper, Comrade Muntumieza, Comrade uh, Bertie uh, Gonzalez, Comrade Owen Stearman, Paul Blakey, myself, Strini Moodley were charged. We were nine of us. But then we won the case because um, the commander of the prison was called to the witness box to give evidence that we defied a lawful command. But the advocate that we had, who was working hand in hand with Dula Omar as the instructing attorney, the advocate was Advocate Falam. They put it to this uh, uh, commanding uh, officer that uh, actually he did not give us a lawful command because he was not there at the quarry. And on that basis, the regional magistrate agreed with um, our argument that we never defied a lawful uh, command, technically in terms of the law. By the way, uh, we had asked uh, Comrade Sets to go into the box to give evidence on our behalf. Now, once they had lost the... Uh, hello? Once, once they had lost the case, uh, they became very hostile to us. And uh, they uh, tried to discipline us um, in uh, many ways. Uh, Comrade Neff has already alluded to the fact that we were taken to various sections. Uh, it was a way of trying to say, let's move our, the, the BC people from various other sections, let them be together so that they can uh, 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 influence uh, one another. But let's move them away from the other people. Now, um, Around uh, 78, uh, early 78 or late 77, we were informed uh, by uh, the ANC that uh, KD Matanzima had uh, asked uh, that um, he wanted to release, he wanted um, uh, the comrades uh, from uh, Transkai to be released. 
and then we were requested by the ANC for an opinion. And uh, we said, of course, uh, that can never happen because uh, the transgay is part of uh, the apartheid regime. It's just a trick to try to be, to do to 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 to, to divide the, the 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 struggle outside by the people. Fortunately, the ANC people agreed to that view, which in any case was supported not on to, was supported by uh, other organizations like uh, the uh, unity movement. Now, um, we never talked about uh, the groupings in prison. We discussed uh, this issue variously, and in particular with the International Committee of the Red Cross. We told them that you, because you always come here as a link between us and the authorities of the prison, please tell them that we do not want to be grouped. What the system must do is that automatically a person who comes into prison must enjoy, just enjoy the privileges which they call by everyone. They, 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 they rather, they, they, every prisoner who comes, uh, every person who comes on Robben Island must enjoy the privileges of an A prisoner. Of course, they refused. And then um, we never uh, uh, agreed that they uh, would be graded. So that some of us, even after 10 years, they still left Robben Island, uh, the BC uh, uh, people, uh, as uh, uh, D uh, 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 prisoners. We were at one stage as well visited by uh, uh, Helen Susman. Helen Susman, will remember, was uh, a member of the Progressive Party in Parliament. She visited uh, Robben Island, and uh, we were then, myself and Comrade Seth and Comrade Zit, staying in B section. When uh, we were told that uh, Helen Susman is around to visit us, we told the orders, myself, Seth, and Zit, that we are not going to meet Helen Susman. And uh, we said, uh, they said, okay, because she's going to be coming to the cells, we don't want her to see you sitting in the cells. We said, okay, we'll go down to the uh, area where we play uh, 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 some games. We went there. When we were sitting there, myself, Comrade Z and Comrade uh, Seth, uh, the head of the prison sent a sergeant who came to warn us that we must come and meet Helen Susman. Otherwise, if we don't come and meet Helen Susman, they are going to take away our privileges. So we decided, okay, this is not worth it, really. Let's just go and see her. So we we found that she was already uh, with uh, the other prisoners in the tennis court, greeting them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then it's worthy of note that. Uh, Practically, as people who, did, uh, as BC activists who did not believe that uh, Helen Sussman could anything for uh, the struggle, should come in prison and come and meet people who are trying to overthrow the regime. She was not part of fighting the system. By the way, we hear from time to time people saying uh, Steve Biko is an anti-apartheid activist. Steve Biko, just like all the BC people, are not anti-apartheid activists. We are freedom fighters. Because if you are an anti-apartheid activist, it means you are just concerned with removing the structure of apartheid. But as the judge in the Sasso BPC case had said, the problem with black consciousness is that you do not want to change 
a little bit here and there, you want to overthrow the whole superstructure. And we said to him, yes, that's what we want. And that's why actually he convicted us. So even in prison, we felt that uh, a person like uh, Helen Sussman should never really be given uh, that uh, opportunity to come and shake hands with us. Now, um, I'm sure we will, uh, comrade the facilitator, uh, stop uh, really at, the, the, at that point because uh, then there may be people who want to ask questions, etc. Thank, Thank you very much, uh, KK. I think it's uh, important to also just point out a few things so that uh, all of you get an idea of what this prison was about. There were single cell sections um, right next to the administration block. And then there were open cells. These were H block cells, you know, like a capital H with a passage in between. There were four cells. And those cells ideally ought to have uh, had 30 prisoners in them. But from 77, right through to 79, the prison was overcrowded. Just as in the, uh, in the, in the mid 60s, when that prison was originally built, more sections were put in and what KK referred to as the Klipkoyer section or the Swartmark section was intended to keep the black consciousness activists separate from the rest of the prison. What began to happen very quickly in January uh, 77 was walls got built between the different sections. So what previously was just a fence between those sections and uh, sort of walkways in between or passages uh, for the warders to move between the one section and the other, then had walls around them. And those walls were intended purely to keep the rebellious 76 youth locked up because we were regarded as a virus that would infect the rest of the prison. And some of the examples given are critical ones uh, where we found that the prison was as quiet as a graveyard. There was no singing, no engagement. And in that single cell section, uh, the famous B section, where you have uh, you know, the, the Rivonia trialists and some of us and various other prisoners there, on the 21st of March, 1978, we held a Shabvo vigil or commemoration. And sad to say, we held it almost alone with one or two speakers, a, P a PAC speaker and so on. But generally, uh, other organizations didn't participate because people were used to being <coughs> on their own and uh, doing things for themselves, but not in a communal way. Fairly quickly in our imprisonment, uh, after the isolation and then the ready, re, you know, the, the section, the D section, the, na you know, the, the name changed from E to D and D to E and so on. But this Swartmach section, when we were moved there, it was uh, one where we engaged with the warders. We called them Bavarder or Warder. But the older prisoners would use the word Minier. So when we engaged with them in the single cell, very intense discussions happened over the use of the word Minier. The unity movement guys would trace it back to Mein Herr from the German and so on. And we'd say, you know, we understand all of that. But basically, if you say Minier on its own and don't say Minier Nevolovodwe, you are saying sir. And we are not going to say sir to any uh, oppressor. 
there were also contestations about whether these were workers or these were oppressors. And we said very clearly, they may be working at a certain level, but they were part of the oppressive uh, infrastructure. So there are uh, critical examples like that to show that the spirit of young people, black consciousness, infested the prison. Last night, there was a, a documentary on the making of Mandela. Uh, it was a discover, it's a Discovery Channel uh, documentary. And in it, and I'll try to quote Mandela uh, quite accurately. He says, the youth changed the prison, meaning all of us who came in there after 76. They hated white supremacy from the bottom of their hearts. Compared to them, we were moderates. Now, another important uh, event, very critical, that happened was that recruitment began to happen from the ANC into black consciousness. Now, I know this is not spoken of too much, but last month, Subusiso uh, Ndebele, uh, in commending um, Ariguala, talked about how they decimated black consciousness. To our credit, we appealed to the ANC leadership saying, if you do recruitment across political lines, what you do is you weaken all of us in prison. We know that there will be some people who will cross but to actively recruit is going to allow the Boers to divide and rule us. All of that fell on deaf ears until the ANC succeeded in recruiting a significant percentage of black consciousness adherents to their ranks. Uh, interestingly, at the point that we had suspended Lakota, uh, Walter Sisulu, who was the uh, liaison, you know, organizations had their liaison to each organization. And uh, old man Walter was the liaison to us. I was the representative to the ANC. And he said to me, man, if you suspend uh, this fellow, you are allowing the enemy to divide you. You should rethink that. Of course, a couple of weeks later, he comes back and tells us, Lakota has applied and we have decided to accept him. And so the rest is, is history. Lakota was used very effectively to recruit from uh, black consciousness ranks. One of the questions raised uh, by you out there is what he raised about Cyril Ramaphosa. Now, let's say right at the outset that all of us who were detained made different kinds of statements. And I myself know I made at least three, probably four statements. Because when you wrote the first statement, you said, my name is so-and-so, I was born in this place, I was born, and they'll come and say, Twak, they prat stuff. And uh, dismiss that. Make a show of tearing up the statement. And then you say, well, what must I write? Je Vietmos. Je Mutskref. And so each iteration meant you would be telling them about yourself, but also they wanted to see who else was involved. Now, one thing I want to point out during this trial, and two years ago, Bani Pichiana, on the occasion of the testimony of Steve Biko being launched in the country, said, unlike other liberation organizations, there were never Mr. X's or Mr. Y's in any of our trials. We acknowledged what we did. Those who testified, testified to the point of even selling out, but we did not become Mr. X roving witnesses against each other. Now that's very important to remember because Mandela always said to us, and KK will remember this, he would always tell us, you know, our organizations have been infiltrated. 
And we, we know that. Our organizations cannot fight a system as rabid as the racist one and expect not to have infiltration. So some of those issues are important to, to just place on the table. There are a few other questions about the quarry and, uh, you know, why uh, it, it, the questions are, tourists are shown the lime quarry during the drive around Robben Island and told about how the older prisoners work crushing stones. Did we work at the quarry? Um, and I think uh, uh, both Nef and KK can answer that further, but because we did work in the quarry and I'm gonna ask them to just talk about it. And I think Nef, you should, you should mention how uh, these guys set dogs on you and uh, butted you with a R1 rifle because we refused their conditions uh, in, in the quarry. Over to you, Nef. Yeah, no, that in, indeed, we, uh, we worked at the quarry and um, uh, there were instances where we didn't uh, agree with what they wanted us to do at the quarry. And KK has mentioned uh, the instances, but there were uh, there was a time when the we re completely refused uh, to tell the lie, and uh, as usual, uh, the warders would use dogs on us, and uh, I was the one who who bore the brunt of uh, the dog. And uh, later, well, I laid a charge uh, against the water. But the case was never attended to. Uh, safe to say that later, the water was transferred somewhere because he was no longer working at the, at the, at the island. But that's, that's what it is. So what, what, what the Comrade said is raising is that at one stage or the other, there has to be um, a change of narrative uh, on Robben Island. Uh, because the narrative there, it's given as if it is a narrative of only prisoners of the ANC. And the rest of the prisoners are not part of the narrative. Uh, so even the quarry, um, the narrative will talk about the 1960s, when the older prisoners went there of the PAC and the, and the ANC. So, so, so the narrative has to change because we were the cause of stopping any work whatsoever at the quarry. We are the people who made sure that political prisoners would not continue to work um, at the quarry or to work at all. And so we were responsible for stopping any type of work at the quarry. So that's a very important, but on a lighter note, uh, when we arrived there, uh, we all of a sudden got to be told that even the food that we were going to receive, uh, there was food for the Indirs uh, and, the, and the food for the Clear Lenge and uh, the food for the Bantu. So food would come in that fashion. If it is breakfast, there will be breakfast for the Indians and uh, the breakfast for the clear lenge. And we started fighting with uh, the system again on uh, this uh, uh, way of looking at the, the food of the people. And what we did in defiance is that food will come in the portions that are meant for the different, what they call the different uh, racial groups. And we will take the food and mix it and eat together. 
if we are outside. But if we are not outside, well, bad luck because they will bring it into your cell. And in that case, you are not able to do anything. But we started fighting the question of uh, food discrimination and food uh, uh, being given in that way because we didn't believe in, uh, in such kind of things. The other thing that I think it just uh, is in a, in, a, in a way, it's a question of studies. They, they, they decided that uh, all people who had gone into prison during our time, that 1976 onward, and who had passed metric will not study, finish and clear. And that only those who came to prison who didn't have metric uh, we're going to be allowed to study. And we had to fight again that war together with the International Red Cross. And um, so some of the guys uh, who went to prison and came out without uh, attaining any degrees and or going any further, it was as a result of the fact that um, the system, Kruger in particular, had decided that no further studies will take place. Uh, in prison because as you know they were uh, abiding by the fair food dictum which says uh, uh, black people were not supposed to be given sufficient education because they wouldn't use it anyway now i just felt that uh, that little part of uh, the story should also be uh, told can, can i just add something very significant that the entire prison was allowed to study and the Sasso BPC trialists uh, from 78 were refused studies. Now, our position, and uh, you know, some of the questions have raised uh, the issue of resistance. Our position was in 77, and we, and, and uh, you know, all of us were university students. We had been in university or had just completed, like Aubrey. Aubrey had been admitted. Uh, as a medical doctor. Uh, so we weren't amongst, you know, the, the lesser intellectually endowed. And we prepared very well and we submitted assignments and stuff like that. But at the end, in October 77, we amongst ourselves said, you know, outside, there is still a boycott of education. How do we sit in prison in all conscience and carry on blissfully as if the struggle is not continuing outside. We're gaining degrees, we're gonna finish courses. Can we do that? And unanimously, we decided, well, you know, we prepared, but let's not write. So we didn't write the exams. The following year, as a clear uh, desire to separate us from the rest, they refused studies. Even when judges, Leonora van der Heerfen came in uh, and, and the minister at the time, the guy responsible for the, the Schlebusch, Schlebusch, he was the minister who came in there. We asked him about studies. Uh, in that section, he said to me, can you finish? Can you write and finish? I said, no, it's not about me. It's about the, all of us. So, well, it's a pity because if you said you were going to do it, I will give you the permission right now. But that was the camaraderie that we had in, in our uh, approach to the prison. We did not have a personal approach to the warders. We adopted a collective response to the warders and kept it at that. I think it's also important to say that most of the time, we were never addressed by our first names. We were always uh, addressed by surnames. Unlike other prisoners where there was a familiarity, you know, uh, I don't know if any of my comrades here now can attest to them having first name, being on first name terms with the Boers in prison. No, I'll give you one incident where the deputy commissioner of prisons, 
he was in charge of political prisoners, uh, General Yanni Ru. He had visited Robben Island and had craver and red wine and whatever else. And for dessert, they decided to come and ask for clachters and for sukkah. Come and ask us, do we have any complaints and requests to make to the uh, general? And of course, uh, I think Sidi Bessel was in the, at the, in the front and he, he said, no, just don't lock the door. Don't, don't bother me. And a few of us went to the office. I, I arrived there with Muntu there, Strini was there and Aubrey was there. So there's this intense discussion happening. And Rue was a very short guy. He had his feet over the desk and he was smoking a cheroot. So around him was this puff of uh, tobacco smoke. And Aubrey was intense and speaking to this man. So I asked uh, Muntu, what's up? So Muntu says, no, Aubrey is raising that he's a medical doctor, but the hospital staff are still treating him like a bandit. They don't uh, treat him with that uh, knowledge that he has as a medical doctor. So this continues. And then I interrupt. I say, excuse me, General. If Aubrey could have killed me, he would have it on that day, at that day. I said, you know, some of us didn't do Afrikaans in school, but we learned Afrikaans in prison. So let me tell you some of the words I've learned in prison. Your masa moor, your sissies and nut plague. Immediately, the puff of smoke, the cheroot dropped, and he sat up and said, from now, warders will have name tags. You will not use hey, you will call the prisoner by their name, and so on. So that's the kind of attitude we adopted. We did not ever have a cap in hand attitude to these guys. They would always say in the general sections, you must remove your cap before you take your food. And you were taking your food from a hatch or given by a fellow prisoner. But there was this attempt to make us compliant. And of course, many of our guys refused to do that. One of those guys was Subusiso Mabaso. And Mandela details that in his book, in Long Walk to Freedom. He says he was called by the warders to speak to Subusiso, and he realized very quickly that if he attempted to do that, Subusiso would regard him as a sellout. So he doesn't raise the issue. So it's things like that that happen, which show that from our side, we were not in a position of being in a reverie, in a, uh, you know, biding our time. This was struggle, but struggle that we had to prosecute on the best terms that we could. And that's why we looked for any opportunity to hit them with their own regulations. Uh, when the incidents that Nef and uh, KK spoke about after the quarry and we were charged with refusing a lawful command, refusing to work in the quarry, uh, creating uh, unrest in the prison amongst prisoners. We refused to even participate in some of the processes there. And we took the risk of asking a magistrate to try us, knowing that if we were convicted on each count, we could have had three months added to our sentence. But KK gave you the responses. And at no point did we ever drop our guard about what our condition was. Those were not our friends. This was a struggle, and we continued that struggle. Now, I noticed that there are a few questions here about when did we hear of Steve Biko's death, uh, and also some dealing with Lakota. Let me just say that in September, it would have been a a couple of days after Steve was murdered, Dalla Omar was our attorney uh, because Shan Chetty was denied access to us. Dalla Omar asked to visit, and he asked to visit, uh, you know, me, was refused, asked to visit, Muntu was refused. 
He went to the third accused and uh, terror, they agreed. So terror comes back that afternoon and says to us, they've killed Steve. Steve's died in prison. And that was a moment when all of us just went silent. Because if you follow the Sasso BPC trial, if you follow what, uh, what the state alleged against us, none of us identified anybody else but our own activities. And indeed, Steve, while we, some of us knew he was Frank Talk, we just said, look, that's a pseudonym. They would beat the hell out of you. Pseudo what? And you say, well, you know, it's, a, it's another name. And uh, Strini was beaten. They said, you the editor of the newsletter. Strini acknowledged he was Frank Talk. Strini could have easily say, you know, it's, I'm the editor. Steve was the writer. So in that famous repartee between the prosecutor, uh, Atwell, the junior prosecutor, and Steve, Steve says, this is my writing. Um, well, it actually, Sogot was leading him in evidence, sorry. And the judge says to the uh, att Deputy Attorney General, Mr. Reese, I thought it's accused number nine, meaning Srini. And Steve says, no, all those writings that you've charged him with are mine. But because of the dictum of common purpose, just by association and holding office, you got convicted of this. So that was the state of play. They wanted to lock all of us up. And if they could throw the key away, they would have done so. Now, there's a question about the physical encounter with Muntu Mieza. This never happened in Robben Island. Uh, there was a physical fisticuff in uh, Pretoria prison. Uh, but it didn't happen in, in Robben Island. Uh, Lakota uh, tended to get into scraps with uh, almost all, all the accused for one reason or the other. Uh, but there was no physical uh, fight in uh, Robben Island between Muntu and Lakota. Uh, he was somebody who was very restless and did certain things which violated some of the security because of uh, communications with our fellow uh, comrades in other sections. And the Namibians complained to us. And we took that up, he denied it, and then continued doing it. And for other reasons, we decided it's about time. I think the accused now had had Lakota fatigue. So we decided we, we need to rid ourselves of this fellow. And the rest is, as they say, history. Uh, anything you want to add, KK? Um, on the question of studies, yeah, you have already really covered it. Um, when we came on Robben Island, uh, they said we could in 1977, guys, you could do anything, but we have cancelled law studies. But then uh, our group was never really allowed, although everything got cancelled, but that already had been cancelled already for us. And then Nchaupe as well was refused permission to work in the hospital. In in, in spite of the, the little talk he must have had with uh, uh, that Ru, uh, 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 director of a uh, 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 head of, uh, of prisons, and uh, Chaupe actually was refused permission in spite of the fact that he's a medical doctor, qualified medical doctor. He was refused permission to work in the hospital and the made use of his skill, of his skills and expertise to help uh, his fellow uh, 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 prisoners. We, when we were, um, before really forcing the system to close up the quarry, the fights, uh, little fights between us and the warders was always there. There was this instance, for instance, um, when uh, one of uh, the prisoners would be given um, the uh, food, uh, the, 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 the lunch box to be carried uh, by uh, one of the prisoners for the orders. 
and we said to the warder, nobody is going to carry your uh, lunchbox. You must carry it yourself. And then really you could see that um, uh, uh, really we were slowly and slowly getting the waters to where we wanted and he started carrying his uh, 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 box of lunch uh, to uh, the lime quarry. Um, my, the other point I needed to uh, make is this. We generally, uh, the trap hoyers and the uh, we, we didn't have a very good contact with family outside. We had the family contacts very late on, and this really uh, is uh, something that was organized by uh, Tom Mantata, who we just buried last week. And really, may his soul, soul rest in peace. He did so much for us in terms of organizing our uh, people to come and visit us. Good. Um, yes, I think uh, not knowing, there isn't much more really one uh, could add from all the points. Otherwise, we'd be repeating this and that and that. Thank you. I, I should just point uh, something out. Uh, there have been a few questions also from Sam uh, asking about the records. The best place for the records of, of our trial is the WITS uh, online system. And uh, what, we're, what we'll do is we'll give that reference to uh, the Limpopo leadership to share with others. And those of you who want it can easily uh, email and we'll, we'll send, it, send you those. It gives you uh, almost entirely uh, the court records, uh, which are lodged at WITS. Um, on, a, on another note, I should just say that the, the stubbornness that all of you know Zitulele Tindi for having uh, was something that uh, was, was legion. And uh, in prison, what Zitulele would do is he would take the puza mantra, add some crust of bread, allow it to ferment, and he would make a macheu from it. The next day, you would have a sort of sour porridge kind of mixture. And for Madiba, he's, uh, you've heard that there were uh, factions and so on. So the sticklers, the Stalinists always said, you, you cannot be seen to be doing certain things like making Macheu yourself, because what will people say? So what he did was, he relied on Zit's macheu. So when Zit made that macheu, uh, Madiba would uh, collect some of it and they would have their soft porridge together. Uh, even though uh, Madiba was, being a life prisoner, was entitled to a, uh, a chunk of bread for breakfast, lunch, and supper. So Madiba was also very uh, smart in terms of understanding young people. And the very next day that we arrived in that section, he said he, would wa he wanted to make an appointment with us to discuss after the exams <coughs> issues. And we said, well, let's discuss them, you know, as they arise. And he went into a long story about, you know, even when Zami visits, now I didn't know who Zami was, but realized a little later that it was Nomzamo. So even when Winnie addresses him, uh, we address using a certain calling name or clan name. And I must say, none of us called him by Nelson, even though the warders did. We called him by Madiba or some other name, you know. Tata, Ndate, etc. And with Zitulele, Zitulele is your classic polyglot. He understands every language in this country. And when he makes up his mind about something, he will not budge. So Madiba realized, here's this Zitulele who's stubborn as an ox. And there's no way that he's going to call me by a clan name. Because 
uh, you know, of who Zit was. So he very cleverly called Zit Omat. And Zit in turn called him Omat. So they called each other Omat, Omat, uh, which precluded Madiba from having the ignominy of some other name being used. But I'm sure Zit was not going to use his first name. He would have used a, uh, an avuncular or uh, paternal name, you know. But it tells you the kinds of testy relationships and sometimes the understanding of where some of us came from. So comrades, friends, everybody who's been on this line, we've stepped way over time. And I want to express uh, thanks to all of you for sharing your time on a uh, Sunday afternoon when you can have better things to do to listen to some of our Robben Island stories. I should just caution, in putting it in English, we sometimes reduce the severity of what happened. Uh, Neff, for instance, did not mention that they were locked up in a single cell section, tear gassed and bait and charged in that section. Now, those kinds of things happen. And the traumas experienced by all of us have been quite deep. But immediately we came out of prison, we continued with the struggle. And here we are again, uh, giving you some insights and sometimes with memory uh, fading or uh, trying to reduce the sheer horror. Because many of our own children, many of our families have not shared the brutality that we experience. And perhaps it is time that we actually did open up and share with all of you the terrible torture, brutality, and indeed the fights we had, not only with the Boers, but with fellow freedom fighters who opened division when we needn't have had division. So go forth, be strong, take care, and uh, let's, and let's have other discussions with other, other comrades sharing their experiences. Amandra. Thank you. Hola. <laughs> Done.